Hello, my name is Tom Ayers, senior staff writer for the Vermont Standard newspaper in Woodstock, and this is another edition of Legislative Update here on Okemo Valley TV. Uh, my guest, as always, is State Representative Tesha Buss, and today's topic is going to be um, a kind of controversial one, and one that's of uh, great import right now in Montpelier and for residents of the Mountain View Supervisory Reunion School District uh, here in the Upper Valley, and that's school construction aid. Um, school construction aid, if I'm correct, uh, Tasha was um, was suspended back in about 2007. Is that correct? That's correct. And and um, right now uh, there is legislation moving through the legislature to um, uh, begin the process of looking at reviving that school construction aid. Can you can you talk a little bit about that and what uh, what the group that's being put together uh, might be looking at in terms of funding strategies? Absolutely. So this process um, didn't just start this legislative session. This last legislative year, we passed a bill that started a working group. Um, actually, they called it a task force. So the task force was supposed to meet a bunch this last summer and fall. And with the July flooding and the robust number of people that were on that task force, it was very hard for them to to complete work in in the detailed manner that they really needed to. And even if they had um, met every time, we may not have still met the goals. So mm -hmm. the legislation that we're putting through will not be to reinstate uh, school construction. It will be to do more work in order to create school construction. So what we don't want to do is repeat the issues that we had in the past, which was that 30% roughly of projects were supported. Um, well, there was a, a, any project typically received 30% of the project's costs paid for by the state. Sometimes it was even higher than that. A lot of times our career and technical education centers um, received a, an extraordinary percentage of money. And what that did was it basically was uh, financially unaffordable for us. So we stopped the program. A few years ago, we did a, a, a facilities needs and basically assessment. Um, it's a tool that a school self-assessed, and the need is at least $6 billion in construction aid that is needed. So as a state, we cannot obviously go out and bond for that. We have to maintain a bond rating, and in order to maintain that bond rating, you can't have too much debt. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're looking at is how can we assist schools not hurt our bond rating? And so what there's something that um, the state of Massachusetts and the state of Rhode Island has created that it can assist in this particular way. And that is you don't give a percentage up front to a project. Instead, you contribute to whatever percentage the state agrees to um, support school construction on an annual basis to the school's bond payment. Ah. And so what this allows us to do is, is to not hurt our bond rating because we're contributing money to a municipal bond instead of the state bonding itself. And there's something called an intercept. So... Um, all the money, like every school budget and their bond payments and whatnot, like that goes into a school budget and that goes up to the state and we figure out how to fund that, right? Well, right now that money doesn't actually go to the state. It's held locally. And then the state says, um, okay, keep the 32 million that you need for your school um, and then send the rest back up to us. Mm -hmm. That will likely change. All of it will go up to the state. The state will intercept what's needed to pay for that bond to ensure that the bonds get paid and then um and then the state will also make their contribution they call that an intercept mm -hmm. um, and that helps to maintain the state's bond rating um, I see. so that is probably the way in which we will actually do the transactions mm -hmm. now what funds the state uses to contribute their percentage whatever that is 30 percent let's say 
That was going to be my next question. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. um, that is what is also going to be determined in this legislation that we are passing because there will be a working group this summer and fall that will work with legislative council. Those are the group of lawyers that support um, helping us write legislation. Mm -hmm. And also the joint fiscal office. That's the team of financial analysts that help determine what is the best funding source. Um, are we going to create a new tax? Are we going to look at funding education in a different way? What other financial parameters might we need to do in order to ensure that the future of education in Vermont is more affordable on Vermonters? Mm -hmm. These are very, very intense questions. And it's uh, it's really challenging to look at. Education is is actually one of the most um, democratized um, sections of what we do in government because mm -hmm. it all is established locally, and then that comes up, right? So it's a bottom up approach, but. One school district can't tell another school district what to do or that one school district being extremely expensive um, is also borne by the budgets, uh, by the taxpayers across the entire state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at in-house education. What can we do to help districts and encourage districts to look at their entire district-wide situation. So this legislation is going to have planning grants. And let me give you a couple of examples of what will have to be in those planning grants so that you can know um, this is what we really want every district to look at. They'll have mm -hmm. to describe their mission, vision, and goals. They will have to, to talk about class sizes and how their spaces are utilized. Do they create, uh, do they have substantially equal education opportunities to other schools in the state? What are their class sizes? What's the facilities assessment? Um, we will have them engage in collaborative discussions with other districts. Mm -hmm. uh, we might have <laughs> them look at adaptive reuse of schools should they choose to do any sort of consolidation. Um, and then how will each community engage with voters on these master plans to assess the current cost of education in their district. Mm -hmm. So the intersection between districts that you just mentioned, could that include uh, districts further consolidating and merging or maybe uh, sharing some resources um, in an overlapping kind of way? I'm not quite sure what the nature of that discussion would be potentially. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is an, the goal is to make sure that every supervisory union, which we sometimes call them districts and some, that yeah. that can be an interchangeable uh, phrase yeah. of legislature, but essentially it is, you know, super supervisory union wide. So if, if you have seven schools in your district, um, you know, right now there is a, a district in the Northeast kingdom and they have, I believe it is seven elementary schools. They are all within, you know, 10 or so miles of one another. Mm -hmm. Right now, they have had to close a school temporarily. Like I'm talking one or two days because they don't have the staffing to have um, that elementary school open that day. So they'll send, um, they'll grade band essentially. So they'll have a teacher at another elementary school and they'll bring over those students and then those students integrate into those classrooms for the day or two days. And then they go back because they don't have enough staffing. Wow. So yeah. We might be in a position where we have to say, um, we actually cannot produce enough human beings to to solve for school sizes in every section of Vermont. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the big question will be, does the state decide that it will, after reviewing all of these plans, 
make decisions that are more top down because we need to ensure educational outcomes and keeping education affordable in the state mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or we will we continue and allow every every town that has a school to have their current democratic opinion as to whether or not they will maintain that school Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We heard testimony that there is a there is an elementary school in the middle of the state that could merge with another school and not cost anything. So their entire budget would go away and we could educate all those kids wow. in another school and not increase the budget of the new school or of the and, school. And it's still relatively, I mean, it's relatively close. The two schools are relatively close in proximity to one another. Others. So, that is right. Yeah. So it's 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 really about taking a more kind of a regional approach across the board from K through 12. But it seems like um, particularly in the elementary schools and the example you cited in the Northeast Kingdom, um, there's some some a lot of room for some creative thinking and consolidation there um, in terms of uh, the potential for uh, state contribution to bond repayments. Um, will there be a formula built into that, that um, similar to Act 60 that, that creates economic equity across um, communities of widely differing uh, demographics? Yes, there will be some sort of poverty metric that is used to determine um, a portion of that percentage. Mm -hmm. be other cr prioritization criteria as well. But, you know, that <clears throat> that poverty metric could be uh, what we call our energy burden. Um, that might be what, what is used um, if you're looking at the poverty metric of a, of a unified dis school district like ours, mm -hmm. it will take into account um, it, it most likely would have some sort of amortized or aggregated amount that that entire community mm -hmm. um, could afford. That That is where the working group has so much work to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is, is figuring that out. And then, um, and then on top of that, what other bonuses might there be for um, this, for additional state contribution? Is it that you have consolidated, um, and reduced education spending, so you mm -hmm. get a greater percentage. Will that be because you um, created a, a new building that is energy efficient or more energy efficient and has a, a lower cost? Um, what are some of those other um, planning items that you satisfied mm -hmm. to, reach, mm -hmm. um, to reach a greater, you know, sort of base share? Sure, sure, absolutely. So... If all goes well, when this legislation uh, moves through over the course of the next um, week to week and a half, and then through um, through crossover and into um, uh, into April, um, what's the timeline for this task force coming back with its recommendations? And is it likely that um, that will happen in the next legislative session? That will happen in the next legislative session. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully the task force will not have July flooding to uh, contend with and it will be able to to work more efficiently. Uh, the recommendation has also been made to make it a smaller group so that we do not have to contend with so many um, differing schedules um, that will mm -hmm. allow more people to be able to be um, present and participating in the work on a more regular basis. It will be a cost neutral working group because the task force did not utilize, I, I mean, it's like under 25% of the money that was created to um, to fund the task force this mm -hmm. last summer. So it will mm -hmm. largely be um, just rolling that money forward um, so that Everyone that will put in, I can't even tell you how many hours, um, will have some sort of um, compensation for that um, assistance. And is this is this task force a joint uh, task force of the Senate and House, or is it solely the House, or does it include outside expertise as well? How does that work? 
So that is still in the in the works who mm -hmm. will actually be on that task force. We are awaiting some recommendations from the Vermont Superintendents Association and the School Boards Association and the Principals Association as to who they would like to have on the task force. Mm -hmm. um, and then certainly the Agency of Education, we actually have um, a new employee and that works with um, someone named Jill Briggs Campbell. And uh, the other guy's name is Bob Donahue. And they are extraordinary. Um, they, they're they taking school construction extremely seriously. They are doing mountains of, of research. We're looking, uh, we're working with the um, buildings and grounds division of state government to determine mm -hmm. Um, if they will be able to help us with vetting contractors and um, also architects and design teams and clerks of the works so that uh, we can make sure that when we do put this up, it stands up and it's sustainable and mm -hmm. really great. So, you know, the other thing that the working group has to do is determine governance. So how will this work? Who will uh, at the Agency of Education vet these projects, determine if they meet the criteria for state funding. Because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that will be that will be a large task and it will be um, one that continues to ongo. And then we'll have to look at how do we look at um, what a school needs to do from here forward to do uh, responsible repair and maintenance. And so one thing that comes into play a lot is what's called the facilities condition index. Mm hmm. And so if your building is past 65% of its lifespan, then it does not make economic sense in conjunction with educational outcomes to renovate that building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's not because of our classrooms and our gyms and our theaters and whatnot. It is largely because of the fact that we need to ensure safety we mm -hmm. need to lock down buildings in a different way than we have ever done before. Mm -hmm. The differences in, in, in efficiencies that are created by um, not having, by certain types of construction versus others. And we have a lot of one-on-one -on -one specialization that's needed for mental health and special education. And right now we have many schools that are renovating closets so that they can do this one-on-one -on -one work. Mm -hmm. And so we need to have what's called flex spaces, so flexible spaces within mm -hmm. school mm -hmm. buildings for us to achieve educational outcomes. So all that has to be balanced. And um, and then also, you know, a lot of times like our school here, if it if we chose to renovate the cost of providing um, that space, swing space, meaning educating our kids in in trailers Mm -hmm. not included in that renovation cost. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that is what also has to be factored into those renovation projects um, mm -hmm. if they happen to be under that 65% in index. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of these issues have been really at the heart of the discussions here in the Mountain Views Supervisory Reunion, um, particularly the whole question of of renovation versus new construction. Um, uh, and, and a lot of the topics that you just touched on have been touched on in the public forums that have been going on in the run up to the town meeting day bond vote. Um, so so um, uh, it just reinforces uh, the argument that the new school is the way, is the, is the most economic and um, effective and, and safe way to go for our students. So. Uh, well, Tasha, I really, uh, is there anything uh, else that you, that I haven't touched on or that you haven't touched on that I, um, you'd like to add? The, the bill is expected to move through the committee okay. and into the House. Yes, within the, the next, next week. So crossover is March 15th. And so every policy bill um, has to meet that deadline. And so mm -hmm. that means that it has to be on the floor of the House, voted on in second and third reading. Um, the only other thing I would add, Tom, is that we will have some sort of look back, meaning the Agency of Education and the legislature certainly understands that some projects cannot wait um, mm -hmm. due to the fact that we could be adding a, a bunch of money to Band-Aid buildings that provides economic hardship to taxpayers and inflationary costs and pressures mm -hmm. 
that mm-hmm. also end up mounting up. And that's hard here because we aren't, until this bill passes and until the task force comes back and next legislative session, we have official answers. We don't know what will be qualified and what will not be qualified Mm -hmm. um, in our project. What we do know is that uh, renovation would not be qualified based on uh, what we have heard from other states, that Mm -hmm. that that is not best practice in other states, that has been vetted in in other states as to why. And that that seems to be something that um, everybody is, is very secure upon. But what what portions of projects that that might be a little bit less um, clear cut, but Mm -hmm. there's also a certain number of each project that is also inherent to just good construction. And um, that is, you know, the agency of education stated that our local project was impressive. um, And I will be digging in to finding out uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) so far. um, They exactly mean by that. And if there's any indication of the look back. You mentioned Bob Donahue earlier, and he uh, he was the signatory on the letter that the uh, Mountain View Supervisory Union uh, Superintendent Sherry Souza received last week, and which I just wrote about in the latest issue of the standard, um, giving what's called preliminary approval uh, to the um, construction project to the ninety nine million dollar um, a bonded construction project, or hopefully bonded. Um, and um, uh, that opens the door for when this construction aid pipeline opens up again, um, the Woodstock Union uh, High School Middle School project is in a very favorable position to be one of the early recipients of that um, uh, of that of that bond um, subsidy. So um, it's good news and hopefully this thing this uh, legislation will move through quickly the task force will not be um uh, compromised by flooding again this summer and um um uh, when we return to legislative update next session uh hopefully we'll have good news to report I sure do hope so <laughs> Tasha, it's as always it's been wonderful speaking with you and uh look forward to connecting with you again um uh especially as we move through crossover and really get into the kind of the meat and potatoes of of legislation uh, and nuts and bolts, I guess is a better word, uh, moving into April. Um, So uh, thanks so much, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Tom.